Great. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Thanks, everyone, for being here. So my name is Sylvain Montagny. I'm a professor at Savoie Montblanc University. I'm mostly teaching about embedded system and uh, IoT in general. Uh, so today's topic is to explain all you need to know about LoRaWAN and we'll try to do that in 40 minutes. Before getting started, I would like to thank Antoine Gagneur, who is here with us today. He's made most of the slides and we worked together to design the storytelling of this webinar. And as it was said, if you have any questions during this webinar, you can drop them in the chat area and we'll try to answer them at the end. Great. So that's the university campus. It's uh, around Chambray. And at this university, a few years ago, we wanted to launch a new project. It's a very common project in university nowadays. It's uh, to connect beehives. So to connect these beehives, we had a few requirements. First, we wanted to put them somewhere in the campus where we wouldn't have any electrical sources. So these systems had to be autonomous and they had to be battery powered, so low power. And the second requirement was that we didn't have access to any network. So we didn't have access basically to the Wi-Fi campus network. So we wanted to have a long range transmission so we could receive them from everywhere. And when we looked at our application, we found out that we only wanted to send a few bytes a day, so we wouldn't need any high bitrate transmission. And these requirements and these features is exactly what LP1 are. So LP1 for low power one, there are four major protocols in LP1. Two of them are called NBIoT and LTEM. And there are two others which runs in the free bands area, which are called Sigfox and LoRaWAN. They target almost the same use case. We started to use Sigfox at the beginning. It worked very well. But there is very nice features in LoRaWAN, which is the capability to use private network. So at the end, we, we end up by using LoRaWAN, and that's still what we're doing now. So to set up this application, the first idea was to use the LoRa modulation. On the bottom right of my screen, there is the beehive, so the transmitter. And on the top left of my screen, I've got the receiver. And the receiver is connected to a laptop where you can store your data in a database. And you can also have a dashboard to display your data in the way you want, in a, in a table or in a graph or whatever you want. And if you only set up a LoRa modulation transmission, it's very easy. You just have to apply the four LoRa modulation parameters. They must be the same channel and bandwidth on both sides, so on the transmitter and on the receiver. That seems quite obvious. And we also have to have the same coding rate. So what is the coding rate? Coding rate is a redundancy factor. Actually, the higher the coding rate, the higher the number of bits you're going to transmit, but also the higher the capacity for the transmission to detect and even to correct errors without retransmitting. And finally, there is one last parameter, which is called the spreading factor. It has to be the same on both sides again. I'm not going to explain that now because that's going to be the topic of the next slide. But again, it has to be the same on the transceiver and on the receiver. And the only thing you have to respect is the European regulation in the 868 MHz band. That's the one we're using in Europe. And the major thing you have to respect is the 1% DT cycle. So what is the 1% DT cycle? The 1% DT cycle is that if you stand during one second, then you have to stay quiet during 99 seconds. If you respect that, then you can set up your lower modulation and it works very well. Great. And like every good project, when we finished this first part of the project, the university went back to us and said, okay, it works, but now I would like to 
have more devices. So I would like to have more beehives, I would like to have temperature sensor, humidity sensor, air quality sensor, everywhere in the campus. So the question is how you can connect many devices all together. First, in my first application, I had only one device, and this device was working on one channel. So the first idea to connect many devices is to multiply the number of channels you're going to use. So let's say I'm going to use eight channels. So now with eight channels, I've got eight more chances to transmit because each device can use one channel so they can sound frame simultaneously. So I can now use eight devices at the same time. The only condition for that is that my receiver, which was able to receive on one channel at the beginning, has now to be able to receive on all channel at the same time. So it's not a, a simple transfer, it's a more complicated one. We'll see that later. But eight channels for eight devices, is it enough in the world of IoT? Of course not, because in the world of the IoT, we are more speaking about tens, hundreds, or even thousands of devices connected all together. So it's really not enough. So we have to find another trick. And the other trick is to use color. And in the LoRa modulation, if you use a different color in the same channel and you're transmitting at the same time, then you're still able to demodulate the signal on the receiver. And what is this color? The color is what we call the spreading factor. And on the LoRa modulation, you have six spreading factor, which means that on each channel, you can have six devices transmitting at the same time. And still, the receiver will be able to demodulate everything. We have six spreading factor, we have eight channels. That makes 48 devices connected together. Same question, is 48 enough? Obviously not. We are more speaking about thousands of devices. So we have to find another trick. And the last trick is quite easy because the last trick is just to respect the 1% DT cycle in the European band. 1% DT cycle says that when you transmit during one, you have to stay quiet during 99, which means that you increase your network capacity by 100. So we have now thousands of devices capable of transmitting together. One could say, my explanation is very theoretical, and that's true. Because I assume in my explanation that all devices are transmitting one after another, which is never the case. Why? Because devices are not synchronized each other. So they have no way to know whether they are using the channel or they are using the spreading factor already and when they transmit. But on the other hand, you will never strictly respect the 1% DT cycle. Because if you consider transmitting every few seconds, then that's maybe that you haven't chosen the right protocol. Because LoRaWAN is more about transmitting every minutes, tens of minutes, hours, or even a few times a day only. Great. What is good now that you can transmit on all channel with all spreading factor? The only condition that you have to respect is that your receiver must have the capability to receive on all spreading factor and on all channel. So it's not a simple transceiver, it's what we call a baseband processor. Great, so we are now able to transmit with many devices on our receiver. Now, I want to add a new features because the project worked well. So the university came to us and said, what about security? We don't want anyone to be able to understand what we transmit. We don't want anyone to transmit things if he's not authenticated. And we don't want anyone to be able to change bytes in the transmission we're having. That is what we call confidentiality, authenticity, and security. It's not specific to LoRa1. Every network, every protocol have to be able to have these three topics and you have to deal with it. So we can add security to our LoRa modulation. 
Will we do that? Actually, no. Why? Because adding security to LoRa modulation is exactly what the LoRaWAN protocol is. So what is the LoRaWAN protocol? The LoRaWAN protocol is the LoRa modulation on which you've had security features, downlink capabilities, roaming features, and many things that I will explain later in this webinar. And what is our receiver? The receiver on the left is what we call a gateway. A gateway, a LoRaWAN gateway, is nothing else than a receiver which is able to receive on all channels and on all spreading factor at the same time. And who is dealing with the security? Security is dealt with what we call a LoRaWAN server, and it applies on the network server and the application server. So at the university, we set up our own network. So we bought gateway. We settled them on the rooftop. And in the room of the university, we installed what we call a lower one server. So both network server and application server. Obviously, if you want to set that up, which is called a private network, then you have to have some skills to set up the server and administrate it. And it's also cost quite a lot of money at the beginning because you have to buy gateway. It's around 1,000 euro and you have to install them on rooftops. So this is a kind of drawback. But if you don't want to do that, you can ask someone else to do it for you. So you can ask this service to a lower one operator and the lower one operator will give you the network coverage it will also give you the server and you will be able to use its own network and application server. There are two drawbacks that you can notice if you use a public network. First of all, if you have many devices, then you have to pay for a subscription. It's not free. And if you have many devices in the same area, then it's much more expensive than a private network. Secondly, if you have, for any reason, devices in a specific location, in a basement somewhere, or behind a building, it's supposed to be covered by the network coverage, but you will always find one situation where it doesn't work. And if you use a public network as you're not specifying where you want to place the gateway, then you have no way, or it's, it's, it's really hard to deal with this situation. So if you want to use both the capability of the public network and the capabilities of the private network, then you can have a mix between these two. It's what we call the hybrid network. And the hybrid network is that we keep our gateways on the rooftops, but we don't want to set up and to install and to administrate our server. So we ask an operator to deal with it. And in that kind of use, then you have the possibility, depending on how many projects you have with your client, you have the possibility to have uh, something which is more scalable. Great. But anyway, whatever the architecture you're using, the, so the type of network, hybrid, public or private, it is exactly the same architecture. So what does a lower one architecture look like. Here we go. On the left of the screen, you've got the lower one and device. It sends data with the lower modulation to the gateway. The gateway is the link between the lower modulation world and the IP world. And the gateway is connected to the server. Network server is dealing with the authenticity and the integrity. The application server is dealing with the confidentiality. Great, so let's go further. We've got our application, our Beehive. So let's register an end device on the server. There are two possibilities to register an end device on a lower one server. The first one is called ABP. ABP stands for activation by personalization. And for that, you just have to set up 
three LoRaWAN information. The first one is what we call the application session key. This is a key that will encrypt the data. So it's set up in the application server and on the LoRaWAN device. The second key for authenticity is in the network server and on the end device. And the third information is something to identify the device again on the server and in the end device. This kind of activation is very easy to set up, but it has a few drawbacks. First, there is no negotiation between the end device and the server about the lower one parameters. So basically, the, the end device doesn't know the frequency plan of the server, it doesn't know the reception delay, it doesn't know the spreading factor which can be used for downlink. So you either set them manually in the end device or you will use the default one. So it used to work very well with the default parameters, but nowadays network server usually don't use the default parameters, so you have to set them up manually, otherwise it would not work properly. That's why there is another way to register an end device on a server, and it's called ABP. The end of the story is exactly the same. You have to have network session key, application session key, and device address on both sides. But it's the way to have them that is different. With OTA activation mode, you start with other credentials on the device and on the server. I'm not going to dive into the details of this credential. It's dev UI, app UI, John UI, app key. And there is what we call a John procedure. During this John request, the server will receive some information that will help it to generate a set of keys along with device address. Once these credentials are generated, then it must be able to transmit this information to the end device so it can have the same one. And this is made with what we call a join accept frame. So here we are in the same situation that we had during the ABP, so nothing new. What is new is two things. First, if there is another join request, then there will be a new key generation. In the security point of view, that's a good point. Secondly, in the join accept frame, the server sent to the device the LoRaWAN parameters that we spoke earlier. So the frequency plan, the reception delay, the spreading factors for downlink, and many things that the end device will be able to set up automatically without doing it manually. So it will work. Great, so back on the campus, we're now able to transmit data from our end device up to the server. And now we are just wondering how we could increase the network coverage. So we were in the campus, but I've got a new device that I set up on the other side of the lake. In this city, across the lake, is it's about 10 kilometers from the campus. And I want to be able to reach it. So the first idea is to increase the power. That's something you can do in the device. But in the European regulation on the band we're using, there is a limit. And the limit is 14 dBm. So once you've reached this limit, then you can't increase the power. And anyway, if you increase the power, you will also reduce the battery life of your device. There is another possibility, which is to increase the spreading factor. So I've designed some circles, and we can see here that if I increase the spreading factor, then I increase the range of my gateway. Actually, I increase the fact that the sensitivity of my gateway will be able to demodulate signal which have less power. So if I, if I want to reach my end device now, I need to use spreading factor 12. Great. So one could say, why don't we use spreading factor 12 always so we can reach further devices? Actually, if you use 
the spreading factor 12, then the time on air, that means the time uh, when the radio is on, is longer. So for transmitting something, if you use a higher spreading factor, then it will take longer. So you will reduce your battery life. So it's good for the range, but it's not as good for the battery life. So once you want to place a device around your network coverage, what can you do? You have to choose the power and the spreading factor to be sure that you can reach your gateway, but also to be sure that you're not having a, high, a too high spreading factor and too high power because you will waste your energy for nothing. Great. So what you could do, you could place your device, check on the gateway the RSSI that you've received and check whether you've got the good margin and if it fits you, then you can keep the, the, the parameters. Obviously, that's not something that you can do because it will take ages. So what you can do, then you can use the network intelligence. And the network intelligence for that is called the ADR. ADR is Adaptive Data Rate. And Adaptive Data Rate is a little algorithm which runs on the network server. And that's the network server which will give you the information of the power and the spreading factor you should use to have the best lower one, in, lower one parameters for your transmission. Being able to communicate with the gateway without wasting power. Good. Back on the campus, I can transmit now with a large network coverage. What I want to do now is to transmit data on my end device. Usually you want to uplink data, so you want to take data from the sensors of your device on the application server. But you, to set up some parameters, sometimes you want to send data to your end device. That's what we call downlinks. In any IoT project, it's not specific to LoRa one it's always hard to join the end device. Why? Because if you want to have a very low power end device, then your end device is almost always in low power mode. So in LoRa 1, there is few classes which will tell you how you can reach the end device. And the first class is the class A. With the class A, you've got an uplink. And the only way you can join your end device is to use two small downlink slots, one second and two seconds after the uplink. Otherwise, you can never join it, except after the next uplink. But the good thing of that is that everywhere else, your end device goes to low power mode. So it's the mode that consumes less power. What if you want more downlink capability? then you can have an extension of the class A and this, on this extension you have a synchronization between the gateway and, the, and the, the end device. And the nice thing with the class B is that you can choose yourself how many slots and the time between slots. So you can configure uh, how you want to be able to communicate with your, with your device. Obviously, a class B and device will consume more energy compared to the class A and device. And finally, there is an extend another extension to class A. It's what we call the class C. And the class C is a class A and device, but you just remove the low power mode. So basically, you can reach a class C and device whenever you want. And obviously, you will consume a lot of power for class C and device because the radio will be always on. Great, so now I can uplink data, I can downlink data. What I'm interested in now is to have a look of what I can see on my application server. So I will choose any application server and I will just show you the timeline, the log I can register and First, I'm going to explain the, the log at the bottom. So the log at the bottom 
are called data. The red down arrow is a downlink. The downlink at the bottom is a user data. So that's basically the sensor you've uh, registered and uh, the data, the temperature, humidity or whatever you want, you want to transmit as a user. Then just above, you've got an uplink with green up arrow, the uplink user data. So we've got the downlink and uplink data. But if we, if we look at the other frames, we can see at some point that there are something called MAC. It could be a complete and single MAC frame, or it could be MAC embedded in a data frame. MAC frame is the intelligence of the network. This is the LoRa 1 protocol. You have nothing to do with it because the end device along with the network server, will speak each other the LoRa 1 protocol, but you as a user, you won't have to deal with it. So that is the intelligence of the network. And for example, it would be the ADR algorithm and many other things. The LoRa 1 protocol is specified by the LoRa Alliance. And depending on the version you're using, then the MAC data, data you, you will see on your network will comply to the LoRa 1 version you've chosen. So in your LoRa 1 stack on your end device, you have to use the same version on the LoRa 1 stack than the version on the network server. The last LoRa 1 version is the 1.0.4. In 2017, there had been a release of the 1.1, but it has never been used by the industry. So at the end of 2020, the 1.0.4, the last version has been released, and it's still the one which is the latest. Okay, back on the campus now. Um, I can have a transmission, uplink and downlink to the network server. I want to see on the network server and application server what I can see. The final thing is, how can I connect my own application? Whether it's a cloud service or it's something that you've developed with another company. So I can, how can I connect it? If I want to connect my application to the LoRa 1 server, then I can use any protocol, basically HTTP or MQTT. On the left, you see the LoRa 1 device, the gateway and the LoRa 1 server, network server and application server. And the way you connect your application, the IoT platform, the cloud service of the user application, the way you connect it to the LoRa 1 server has nothing to do with LoRa 1. So it's just basic web protocol with API and you can very easily connect to this application to have your data and to have a nice dashboard. Great, so we've got everything settled. Hand device, gateway, network server, application server, and IoT platform. That's the end of the first part. Don't worry, the second part will be very short. If you want to dive further into the ecosystem, first, there is a free ebook available on our website. Uh, it has been reviewed by the LoRa Alliance, and we're we are very happy about that. There is a French and an English version. Uh, it's free and it's available. There is also uh, video courses. So there is a video course in French. It's more than 100 video, around four minutes each. And there is many explanation to go into the details of the LoRa 1 protocol, which is sometimes hard to explain in a book. And a few weeks ago, we released a new video in English. Uh, there hasn't as many video as the, there is in the French one, but they will at the end. And finally, we have a, a three days training. It's only in French so far, but it will be in English on demand. And the purpose of this three days training is that we send you a device, a gateway, a server access, and we can build together a complete private architecture or one network. You can find... Yeah, yeah, in, addition, in addition, Sylvain, as I, had, I have done this morning, and it's very important to note, uh, 
Laura Alliance, but also Semtech, uh, have certified the the the, the, the e-book and the video courses uh, proposed by the the, the Savoie University, and it's very well rec uh, recognized by uh, by the the, the the Laura ecosystem for the for the Chambéry University and uh, Sylvain. Uh, good job and very appreciated by by, the, by all the worldwide ecosystem, not only French or. European but worldwide ecosystem and thank you so much. Yeah, we're very happy about that. Uh, just to let you know that for the video course, uh, it's free for university or it's free if you've got a, an educational project. So just come to us if you want the access of this video. Great, so for the second part, it will be short, but back on the campus, I just zoom out and the campus is on the left. So I just put the gateway and the network coverage. I can see the device on the other side of the lake. And now the question is, what if I've got another device somewhere outside of my network coverage? So the city we can see on the right is Chambry. And I've just placed a new end device in Chambry, but it's outside of my network coverage. But I know that in Chambry City, a few years ago, they set up with a private operator, the Laura One network. What could I do? I would like to have an agreement with this network. And with this agreement, I would be able to gather my Laura One information from my end device, even if it's not on my network coverage. For that, it's a commercial agreement because technically you can do that in the Loa One specification. So the two network server from Chambre City and our network server will connect each other, but you must have a commercial agreement. Is it expensive? Actually, I can't really tell you because if it works in only one way, so which means that I can place my end device in their network, but they don't have the possibility to place their end device in my network, then obviously it would not be free. But it could be a win-win situation. We could say that, great, we can extend both network coverage. So I can place my end device in Chambry and you can place yours in my network coverage. So it could even be free. That's just a commercial agreement. Technically, the Laura One specification says exactly what you have to do if you want to connect in a roaming agreement to network server. And having an extension of the network is not the only benefit. The other benefit is that you can increase the density, the gateway density of the network. So it's not presented on the, on the scheme here, but why is it good to have a, a more density network because there is a little problem with the LoRa one network is that the downlink capability is very limited it's not a problem it's a fact but if you have more gain if you have more gateway in your network coverage then you will be able to send more downlink to your end device and the last point which is very important if you remember what we said about the possibility to transmit with a specific power and a specific spreading factor, then if you have more gateway around, you have more chances to have one gateway which will be beside you. So you can reduce your power and you can reduce your spreading factor. So you can increase your branch life. And at the end of the day, you will not pollute the others with radio, radio frequency waves. So it's always a huge benefit to uh, share the gateway around the around the area back on the campus uh, now what i want to do is to use a part of the device that i haven't used so far so in my end device i've got a humidity sensor actually it was a temperature humidity sensor i used only the temperature and now i want to use the humidity as well great so what i want to do is to update my firmware Obviously, I can go on the device, plug my programmer, and I can upload a new firmware. But if you imagine that you've got thousands of devices in the field, and it would probably be now in private area, then you can't do that easily. The LoRa One specification 
says that you can do what we call FIOTA. FIOTA is firmware update over the air. So you can send a new firmware over the air. Obviously it takes time, it's quite long, and it uses several other services that are also specified by the LoRa Alliance. It used the clock synchronization service, which lets you and device having the time. So you can use this service independently. So it could be very useful to have the time on the on the end device. It used the multicast service, so it could be also useful to useful to send uh, one frame to many devices, and it also used what we call a data fragmentation. So you are able to transmit a, a large amount of data in your end device because obviously the new firmware will be probably a few tens of kilobytes and you can't send that in only one frame. Great, so, so that, that's something we've, we've tried and that's something that we've documented. So it's obviously documented in the specification, but sometimes the, the documentation is a bit hard to understand. Uh, we launched a few weeks ago a new free ebook, also download, downloadable on our uh, website. It deals with clock synchronization if you want to know the time of your device, with multicast, data fragmentation, FIOTA, and there will be documentation in the, in the next week soon uh, about roaming. And as it's quite hard sometimes to uh, explain things in a, in a book, uh, we've got a YouTube channel where you can find some demonstration and again it's free, you can have access to this, uh, to this video. I thank you very much for your attention and I can answer your question. Thank you very much.